What's up everyone? Alex and Daniel here. Right now, we're joined by Yakuza localization producer Scott Strickert, and we'll be talking to him about his experience with localization leading up to him working on Yakuza Kiwami 2. How's it going, Scott? Great, good to be here. I'm so happy you gave us an opportunity for this. Yakuza is like one of my favorite series, and Daniel's as well, right, man? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I love the Yakuza series. It's It's been with me for pretty long now, <laughs> now that I think about it. That's awesome. Yeah, and we all go back. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally, yeah. <laughs> totally fine. Totally fine. I just want to say, you know, thank you very much for doing this interview. It was very kind of you. Uh, no problem. It's not like it's taking away from any of my work. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best way to start this interview is to ask this question. Uh, prior to Yakuza, can you name some games that we'd probably find your name in? Oh, God. So I've been doing this like 10 years, and th that list of games is probably 60 to 70 games deep at this point. Two years ago, I was working at Square Enix, and you'll find my name in a, a lot of the Final Fantasy titles. I was a brand manager there. Um, prior to that, I was at level five doing um, basically anything that they localized, including the entire uh, 3DS Guild series, which was a bunch of cool little games by famous creators from Japan. And prior to that, I was at Atlas, um, where I worked primarily on our Japanese titles, including Catherine, Persona 4, 3D Game Heroes, Sheer and the Wanderer, that list goes on and on and on. <laughs> You've certainly run the gamut. Definitely. What I was looking for, really, Scott, is Izuna. Like, I didn't hear Izuna in any of the things that you mentioned, so... You're right. I, and there are people who would be very upset that I did not mention Izuna to Return of the Unemployed Ninja. <laughs> It's. I actually got that game a long time ago. That was. Uh, that was hard, man. It is a hard game, but I, I don't know. I was both editor and QA lead for that game, and I. I love it to pieces to this day. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, you guys heard that right there. Okay, he wasn't not mentioning it on purpose. So you know, cool your jets. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, "What game are they talking about?" Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of curious because you obviously have a storied history with localization and stuff. How How did you wind up? you know, finding yourself in the Yakuza series or being part of it. Oh, man. Um, I credit all that to uh, director of production over here, Sam Mullen, who, you know, he and I go back to our first, what we call our first deployment at Atlas. Um, <laughs> and when uh, they were onboarding uh, Yakuza over here, they, you know, he wasn't going to be able to handle that himself. And he's like, I know a guy <laughs> called me. <laughs> and he's okay. like, hey, man, how, you, how would you want to work on a, on a pretty big franchise we've got going over here. He didn't say the name, but I kind of had a hunch. And at, at the time, I wasn't all that enthused because I was like, oh, Yakuza, that uh, Japanese GTA game, because that's how it used to be marketed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was it was nonetheless a really cool opportunity, and I took it, and all to discover that Yakuza is anything but Japanese GTA, which is, uh, has been an incredible journey to both teach myself and the rest of the world that fact. So your first exposure to the series, like proper, was working on it. Basically, yeah, I had not played it prior to having to being told that it was going to be my jam. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, I guess like this begs the question, right? Like, how much of you know that knowledge did you have to ingest and stuff in order to be prepared for your first Yakuza project? What preparation did you have to do? My first day, Sam handed me a stack of four games and a digital code for Yakuza Five, and he said, "Go." Oh. You have a month. <laughs> you have a month? <laughs> more or less. Um, yeah, I, I was hired in October. I had until end of year, I guess it's more like two months, uh, to get through the entirety of the Yakuza series. And that's exactly what I said about doing, which I mean is fine when you're playing it, you know, six to eight hours a day. You know, I, I was starting to get pre-pro done on Yakuza 0 at the same time. So it wasn't like I was just sitting at work playing video games, but you know, becoming a walking, you know, wiki of the Yakuza universe was was first um, first order of business for me, really. Yeah, I, I bet that was daunting, like to be able to, you know, have to articulate a series, you know, pretty much like after playing five games and be able to just be that authority, right? Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, we viewed Yakuza Zero very much as a series reboot. You know, we did we weren't going to be beholden to anything that had come before it unless it was. Uh, you know, that's not to say that every every decision that got made prior was a bad one, but there were there were certain decisions where we were like, okay, you know, this is how they did that. This is how I want to do this. This is how they did that. This and that's great. Let's keep it kind of thing. So we went through kind of, you know, broke the game out and said, this is this is how we're going to approach it for for at least this 
the coming future because you know we were we were more or less looking to looking beyond zero to Kiwami and six even which was you know still very nebulous at the time but we wanted to make sure that you know there'd be consistency in the series and you know it was all about deciding what 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 to localize how to localize it what fonts to use all that stuff and that's um, you know it was it was it was a nice benefit to really kind of come in at what was technically the beginning of the series you know at least timeline wise with Yakuza Zero. It allowed us to do that reboot. Was the Yakuza Zero your first project in the Yakuza franchise? Yes. Okay. How were the games previously like handled and stuff? Like, was it done internally or was it like outsourced or anything like that? Uh, Sega used to work with this cool group of guys called Inbound. Um, they, they are a great translation agency, and we worked with them as well on Yakuza Zero in in the handing off of the titles to to moving it internally. Mm-hmm. For, um, for for me and my team, and uh, I can't speak highly enough of them. I mean, they 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 did it, they knocked it out of the park previously, and you know, one of the reasons Yakuza Zero's localization is so great is because it literally got two full editing passes, where they they went through and did their pass, and then on, we went and added that you know Atlas Magic on top of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting that you mentioned it. The localization process over there is like that Atlas you know, magic, even though, you know, not a lot of people actually still know that Sega and Atlas are like these two combined entities these days. It's kind of interesting to think about it. It is. It's it's a really cool thing to think about just because, I mean, I, I think Atlas has always brought a lot of expertise to uh, Japanese localization, and that's what we were able to bring to the Yakuza series. So it's really cool. I always felt that with Atlas's localizations, they always tended to try and bring out the spirit and the soul of the source material and it it always felt like when I like Persona Four, for example, um, they it was kind of unabashed. Like even in like the questions that was being asked, like it, even if the player had like would normally speaking an English player would probably have no idea what some of the questions are because they're steeped in like you know more in like a Japanese methodology. Um, it would still be in there, and that that's kind of how I feel about it in regards to its authenticity. I would say that with Atlas in particular, I always felt that there was something very authentic about the way that they translated games. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's there's a certain sense of, like, I guess you're right, authenticity is a great word for that because Atlas does bring that to the table, especially for these titles that are set in Japan, like, like Persona, like Yakuza, where we, you know, we're bringing players to the source a little bit kind of expecting them to bridge the gap a little bit to them for themselves to be like hey you know I, i'm playing a game that's not really set in the country of my of origin for me but that's what's kind of cool about it like you get to really experience uh another culture through these games and that's that's an important part of carrying that over in in our localizations because we don't want to water that down or try to make it too you know oh well they might not know what this is let's make it friendlier you know and that's that's a constant conversation we have to have in that sense, I would say that the way that Persona games are handled and the way the Yakuza series is handled kind of goes hand in hand. Exactly. And I think, you know, tr- working on Persona, uh, another game called uh, Attack of the Friday Monsters and coming to Yakuza really gave me a lot of the experience I needed to, I think, really kind of own this, which was really cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, I, I wanted to ask, so what were the challenges of taking over the series, given that there's been a lot of established conventions in the previous games? I think what challenged me the most is <laughs> Goro Majima. <laughs> okay. But that's part, partly because, you know, as as I've done, as I was going through the localization, you know, ringer, it, I wanted that kind of challenge. Like, I really do seek characters that challenge me to write in a, in styles that are not necessarily my own or, or to, to uh, bring out accents and that kind of thing, because I feel like that's that's a level of localization that uh, you see in... in some of the highest caliber localizations out there, uh, to be quite frank. And knowing that he had this Osakan accent and seeing how it was rendered prior to the, to this, I, I felt like my own uh, interpretation of that and the way that I've rendered that in throughout Zero Kiwami and Six to some degree, Kiwami Two more so, is a little bit different. And I and I hope people like it. Um, ultimately, I mean, people really do still seem to latch onto the Majima, but that's I don't take credit for that because he's an amazing character and the, the devs know exactly what they're doing with him and hopefully i'm just doing him justice you know <laughs> that's great actually 
So we're going to kind of go into a little bit of the, you know, localization process a little bit more in, in just a minute. First, you mentioned in your previous interviews that you're currently managing a team of people who work on localizing these games. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you guys have decided to go this particular route versus the other methodologies that other companies use? We use translators and editors, um, and the and a lot. I think a lot of companies rely solely on translators to kind of convey it, and then the editors do more of a, a light grammar and, and fixing kind of pass. Whereas the target language is what we the editors really bring out here, um, because that's partially what the Atlas style is all about. You know, we we want to make it as approachable as we can without ever crossing that line to changing it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's a, it's a constant balance, and I use this term often, but between clarity and authenticity. You know, we want to make sure it's absolutely clear, but we absolutely want to keep it authentic, like Daniel was telling, talking about, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does sound like a difficult balancing act of trying to bring out the life in something without compromise. Yeah, there's it, it, it is compromise. Every every line is a compromise to some extent, you know, because mm -hmm. we will we'll hammer it out and be like, oh, this sounds too stilted. B bring it Bring it further in, and then... Or, you know, we'll bring it further out, you know, make it sound better. And then, oh, it's gone too far from the Japanese. Bring it back in kind of thing. And sometimes those that back and forth on an individual line can happen, you know, multiple times. And it just at the end of the day, you have to finally find that that right spot for it. You know, I, I guess what I meant by compromising that instance would, would be more so compromising like the the spirit of the material. Yeah, I mean, no language translates directly into another language perfectly. That's that's mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what it is. There's this great quote that goes that uh, was semi-viral in localization circles not that long ago about um, how a piano can play a piece built for violin and still carry the way that it's supposed to sound, but it obviously has to make accommodations for the fact that it's a piano, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very much what localization is to me, which is, you know, it's translating one instrument to another while still maintaining the way that it, this piece is supposed to sound. So what were like the most memorable story that you have with regards to localization and consulting your team and trying to figure out like the best possible way to, you know, achieve a specific localization and stuff? Can you tell me a little bit about that? There are so many. <laughs> I tried to pick one. Um, I guess one of the more recent things we've worked on with, with the team was um, Y6. And, you know, one of the things I think people really gravitate toward is the live chat. Ah, yes. <laughs> I didn't do, handle that text personally. That was all kind of done by one of my editors, John Reisenbach. Um, great guy and knows his stuff. But, you know, he was more than willing to take that task on <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> and <laughs> it was him who really lobbied, I guess, for, for, being it, for making it really chatty making it sound like a perfect like a like a real amalgamation of a chat room and we got the the developers to implement the lenny face and you know i can't believe i was asked i i had to literally put in a request to developers like hey there's this icon that happens in the west and we want to put this in the game can you even do this <laughs> and like you know <laughs> And they're like, yeah, we can try to do that. You know, let's let's take a look at it. And I swear we must have gone back and forth on that icon for like a month just trying to get it to render correctly in the text. And I can't believe how many hours we wasted getting the Lenny face to work in that chat. But it did. Wow. <laughs> at the end of the day, there was a Lenny face in, in the chat. And I told John to make sure he used it liberally because for all the work that went in getting it. I remember seeing it. <laughs> And I, it gave me a good chuckle, so that work was not wasted. Excellent. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, so another thing that I kind of noticed with, especially with like Yakuza 0 moving forward, since that was like a PS4 game, is that these games, like when they arrived in the West and stuff, they're not blocked from like streaming or recording video. Of course, until you get to the more spoilery sections, like towards the end. But we know that in Japan, these are all completely blocked. Like, what is the, what changed with regards to bringing them over here that all of a sudden they're not blocked anymore? There's a, first, I guess I should say, clarify that there's a very distinct kind of culture difference between Japan and the West w with regard to the blocking of content. So um, when content is blocked in Japan, it's usually because there's, there's an actual kind of cultural thing around it that's like, why would I want someone to be able to spoil it for me before I buy the game? There's, a, I guess it's like, there's, they're just very concerned about spoilers over there. It's like, mm -hmm. it's not fair to, to have to watch something that I haven't gotten to yet. And so if I see that, I'm gonna write to Sega and say, Sega, how dare you not block this content when I, you know, I got spoiled, man. And it's all your fault kind mm -hmm. of deal. Wow. And 
in the West, as you know, that's really not the way that we think about it, I guess. We're also very conscious of spoilers, of course, but we don't we don't want to we want the freedom to be able to to look at them if we so desire, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and knowing that knowing that there was that there would be kind of backlash if we just kept the way that it was blocked. We we approached Japan very gingerly, mind you, that we're like, hey, you know, if it, in the West, we'd really like to have this content shareable and we, we do understand that it's kind of spoiler heavy but to be fair you guys have had this game out for a year you know anyone who wants to be spoiled has already gotten that spoiled for them so you know can we do this and they're like you know what it's your territory you guys decide ah. so we we were like great that's that's an awesome attitude and from then on that's that's kind of how we we've, we've handled it and only blocking the ending because the ending is the part we do want to you know protect it's the end right mm -hmm. yeah. that makes sense and i'm i'm really glad that that was able to happen because it was moments like uh, bowling for a turkey and getting a chicken. You know, it was <laughs> moments like that being a, like someone being able to capture that easily and then throw it up on Twitter is, I think it, it's fair to say that it was some, it was things like that that allowed the game to thrive the way it did. Absolutely. We owe a lot to that damn chicken. <laughs> nice. Nugget, <laughs> Nugget, you will always be remembered. <laughs> well, we don't. We had no idea. You know, it's just something that happened. You don't. You don't. You can't control the internet. No matter how much a marketing team would believe that, you know, hey, we need to do this to go viral. Go make it go viral. That's not something you can control. Whatever kind of happens, happens. And what you know, the content. You don't know what the fans are going to latch onto. But the, there it is. You know, it, there's, there's there's what they latched onto, which is incredible. It didn't quite go viral, but I did post a tweet of uh, Kiryu punching the shark in Yakuza 6, and that got some attention, so... Yeah, Hopefully, I, I loved that, that whole sequence. That's actually my background on PS4 right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure I sold at least one or two copies just by posting that tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Scott, I got to ask you an NJPW question because we have a oh, no. lot of <laughs> Yes, oh no. Because we actually have a good number of fans who actually watch NJPW and they were pleasantly surprised to learn that Yakuza 6 featured some of the more high-profile wrestlers there. Now, this is just a personal curiosity of mine because I, I don't think anybody else would think this way. But did you and your team have to watch some of these promos to make sure you got the characters right? Like, because I think Naito's was really spot on. We didn't have time to really dig into their characters because at the end of the day, they weren't, they were themselves playing a role in Yakuza, right? And so it was more important to us to make sure that the role that they were playing in Yakuza was uh that we got that right over their their wrestler role but man it was it was really tough to make sure that we caught all the references and the inside stuff uh and i i i'm to this day not 100 percent sure we did but uh and i credit one of our qa testers uh ian who is a huge njpw fan who was like yo i'm gonna look through all of this stuff and <laughs> you're gonna have to you're gonna have to change a few things and like I, I leaned on his expertise for sure because it was awesome to have someone who who knew it you know like the back of their hand we didn't have time to familiarize ourselves with an entire lore essentially all for us uh a mini game essentially in yakuza 6 really um and naito to this day i'm not sure that you know we we played up that spanish aspect we kept you know because we're in southern california we everyone almost speaks spanish by default here you know <laughs> um but the there's you know we we brought out a little bit more of that that the random spanish words that you know i think are, are fairly prevalent in even english now so hopefully that did his character right all i can at the end of the day hope to do is make sure that we do them a solid since Yakuza Kiwami 2 uses the same engine as Yakuza 6, what improvements can we expect this time around? There's a ton of stuff that's kind of new to Kiwami 2. Uh, I think a lot of people felt the battle system was a little slow, and as a result uh, for Kiwami 2, it's definitely got some speed added to it. Uh, you, you'll definitely feel it like it's like it's a little snappier. Um, there's charge attacks now that, that you can weave into your combos. There's a oh, lot of the awesome. areas of uh, Kamurocho that were previously closed are, are restored, so the Champion District. And yeah, I was about to say the Champion District. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's all back. Uh, so a lot of the mini games, um, like the gambling is all back. Um, a bunch of new stuff that's been added uh, to flesh out the Yakuza 2 story, like the Cabaret Club from Zero is completely back, and uh, the Clan Creator stuff from Six is back and completely different, and it's, it's a beast of a game, quite frankly. Um, and 
you're just going to see little improvements throughout the whole thing. And it's it's really awesome to see how much that engine had matured in, in the course of, I mean, to us, it's going to feel like four months, but it was about a year. Wow. Now, Yakuza Kiwami 2 is a remake of the original PS2 uh, Yakuza 2. So with that in mind, and knowing that that game was handled by a different localization team, uh, how much of the localization has changed from the original PS2 release? Quite a bit. Um, we have more space, first of all. Um, the windows are bigger in Kiwami 2, and so we were really able to, I think, dig deeper into the characterization at times. Um, there's an NPC very early on in the game called Kurokawa, right? Um, and he's my kind of my go-to guy for pointing out some of the localization differences. He's... Uh, <laughs> it's hard to describe to someone who hasn't played the game frequently, you know, in a while, because you're like, oh, I don't remember some NPC named Kurokawa. But if you look him up at the original Yakuza 2 text and then you read the Kiwami 2 text, it's going to feel almost totally different. And that's partially because we're bringing back things that, you know, got written around in Yakuza 2, where like they were like, ah, oh, people aren't going to understand this. Let's just write around it. Uh, we, we straight up do it. Like Kurokawa actually explains what his name means in the text. So that's now back. So he's like, oh, my name means Black River in the original English text, he's like, it's a pretty name, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, you know, and little, little things like that. And that's not to say that the original localization was wrong or bad. We actually kept a lot of it because it was like, oh, this is right. Or, oh, this, wow, this is a really clever way to say that. Thank God they they thought of this. Please, please tell me you, you left in Peacocked Your Mom. Oh, uh, I mean, I wasn't allowed to change that. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. <laughs> there would be a riot. There would be a riot. And it, I, I mean, I did, I did that, and you'll, you'll see what I did after that scene. But it's because it's so out of character for the way we write Kiryu for him to say, "I peacocked your mom." But there's a little joke in there that follows that now. <laughs> I, see. I, I know. I mean, looking back, especially after so many games, like yeah, it is out of character, but I don't know. It's such a good line. <laughs> it's such a good line. You can't, you can't not peacock the mom. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, guys. <laughs> You have the other option to pick, yeah, uh, my bad, but no one's going to pick that. <laughs> no one. Like, even people who are dedicated to, like, making sure that Kiryu is on the straight and narrow, they're still going to pick it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't not. <laughs> now, uh, with, with that in mind, um, regarding differences between the two versions, um, what kinds of surprises can fans who have played the original release expect from Yakuza Kiwami 2? I think that overall we've able, we've been able to make a little bit more sense of it. Um, using there's some things that Kiryu does that don't get really get explained that don't really have a like a lot of logic behind it. Like um, whereas we've got those objectives that we write the Kiryu's literal inner thoughts on, and now you, now there's like a clear way that uh, that Kiryu can that you'll that you'll see Kiryu's kind of kind of logic for doing certain things that he does in that game. Um, and you know he's still very early Kiryu, so there's there's a certain sense of kind of, you know, aloof badass osity to him that um, that I think that fans hopefully won't be surprised by because at the end of the day that's that's what's expected of Kiryu at that at that stage in his life. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's just all kinds of new stuff to Kiwami too, and it's it's gonna surprise a lot of people that, you know, and we've also been able to integrate it more into Zero, which hadn't been written at the time. So there's things about, you know, when Kiryu first arrives in, in Sotenbori, instead of saying uh, gosh, I mean, you know, seeing Sultan Boy for the first time is, you know, hey, I haven't been here in ages kind of thing. You know, there's there's like a there's zero has now become canon and, and it has, you know, reverberating effects on Sultan Boy, which is really cool. Uh, I also wanted to ask real quick, because you had mentioned the inner thoughts. Um, it, are those like translated from the Japanese version or... Are, is that something that you guys added? That is actually us, um, and with Japanese dev team's permission, of course. Um, in 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 the Japanese version, the the objective repeats itself in in a different way. It'll be like um, you know, go to the grand versus like go see what's happening at the grand. And when we put that in English, it's like super redundant. And so we asked if we could use the second bullet point for um, you know, kind of helping to explain the objective a little bit better and going inside Kiryu's head. And, you know, the dev team was very gracious in allowing us to write that. They do check them. Um, it's the, the whole thing of it is that we know Kiryu well enough at this point to at least be able to bridge, you know, why he's doing something. And I, I really appreciate their trust in allowing us to do that. Yeah, I actually find it interesting that, you know, a lot of what you guys do also, you know, even though you guys have more space now, you know, now you guys are running into more of a UI issue and a text filling issue than anything else, you know, like just kind of 
trying to make much of like what is given in that small space because like back in the day and stuff you know like you had to like especially in the ps2 i'd imagine you'd had to really be creative and you know kind of like do the thing like you know peacock your mom and stuff because you really barely had any space to work with you're absolutely right you know we have a huge win dialogue window for this and coming from a world where you know like i worked on a game called knights in the nightmare where you had two lines of 22 characters and you know that that would turn a beautiful sentence into a, a rote routine sad sentence wow you know i walked among the forests and it echoed in my mind kind of thing you know that that for that line would become like the forest sure had a, an echo <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that, 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 that's kind of the sadness of it but you know with this with the amount of space we have to work with on this game it's there's never a reason to not be able to ex fully express what we need to express and that's awesome I think the uh, being able to reuse the objectives to kind of explore Kiryu's inner thoughts was actually a brilliant idea. And man, you guys really hit it off the park on that one, I think. Oh, well, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. But now let's talk about the future. And don't worry, Scott, I'll only ask one question about this. Oh, Can, boy. Yeah, be ready. Can you offer us a small hint as to what's coming next after Yakuza Kiwami 2 that you're working on? What are you trying to do, Alex? You trying to jinx this whole interview? You trying to make me <laughs> spill beans I'm not supposed to spill? <laughs> you know, I can't. I can't say too much. Um, I am excited about it, and I'm hoping that everyone else will be too. So basically, our takeaway is: please be excited. Then. I love that line. Yes, please be excited. You should just co-op that. Ah, <laughs> uh, Hashimoto-san, uh, you're the best. Yes, absolutely. And that concludes part one of our interview with Scott Strickard. In part two of our interview, we'll be asking him all the questions you sent in via Reddit, Discord, and Twitter. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon so you won't miss that video. Also, I just want to give thanks to Jacob over at Sega for helping make this happen. Thank you for watching, and have a wonderful gaming week.